Hey guys, and welcome back. This is Autofocus. I'm Steven Streeter. Today, we're going to talk about how Taika Waititi's take on Thor in Love and Thunder was refreshing, thought-provoking, and probably the best movie in the Marvel Universe. Wait a second. Strike that. Reverse it. Love and Thunder is more or less a victory lap for Taika Waititi after his revitalizing reimagining of Thor in Ragnarok. This new addition to the Thor franchise is gushing with possibilities, as its story is drenched in humor, a dash of discomfort, and some truly traumatic subject material. Love and Thunder tackles lost love, grief, abandonment, and cancer with a lighthearted and unique style, proving that Watiti's vision is original and unlike anything the Marvel Universe has heretofore experienced. An ultra-saturated cartoonish journey dripping with audience pandering and so much exposition it's laughable. Come, come, gather round and listen to the legend of the Space Viking. Let me tell you the legend of Thor and Jack. What do we know about this guy? With a necro sword. What's omnipotent city? Hang on, he moves through shadows and he's going to the Shadow Realm. It seems like that's where he's going to be the most powerful. Oh, like an engine. Like an engine. You need a ship. I've got a ship. A film so aware of itself, it just can't stop reveling in its own assumed awesomeness. And sadly, that is the very reason it's so painful to watch. Love and Thunder opens strong, with Gore, a humble father, desperate in a barren wasteland. After the untimely death of his daughter, Gore loses faith in his neglectful god, is chosen by the Necrosword, creates an army of shadow monsters, and is set on a vengeful path to kill all gods. Christian Bale is impressive in the role of Gore, as he takes the audience on a journey through the struggle with the grief of losing his daughter. Unfortunately, his screen time is so limited, his character's arc is barely noticed and at times contradictory, kidnapping children a la the child catcher in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Meditating in the shade of a tall oak tree, Thor waits in silent contemplation until someone says, Thor, we need your help to win this battle. Then, like a savior, he joins the battle and single-handedly wipes out the opposition. Well done, everybody. We can collectively take credit for that because we worked as a team. We use our hearts and our minds to defeat the enemy with minimal loss or damage. Chris Hemsworth wears Thor like an old suit, a dim-witted, muscle-bound moronic suit, working through issues of loss and sacrifice, but if we take a look at his character's arc through the Thor franchise, we go from an overconfident Thor who needs grounding and growth, to a humble and wise hero having learned foresight and patience. Then enter Taika Waititi's take on Thor in Ragnarok. Thor is no longer a boring, humble hero. He is boastful, disingenuous, reckless, and absurd. He portrays Thor much like Renfair play-acting, high on popularity and too distracted by his celebrity to lose himself in the character. Look at me! Look at me! Look at me! I'm a superhero! In this film, Thor feels more like a me monster than the God of Thunder. He needs to step it down a notch so as not to overshadow the dramatic themes presented in the film with lame humor that doesn't land and is more like kicking a dead horse than anything actually funny. But we can't lay the blame on Thor's massive shoulders entirely. The jokes just keep coming. Be it from Thor, Val, Jane, Korg, or just some random characters in random sequences. For example, after a brief introduction to our two heroines, enter the screaming goats. These goats are so excruciatingly painful, it's hard to push through their time on screen. This joke feels like it lasts for an eternity. And you just wish the goats had found their way into the editor's trash bin, but no. They are present for the remainder of the film, thankfully shutting up after about three minutes of incessant screaming. Just enough time for a bathroom break. Thanks, Watiti, for this insufferable excrement. Oh, and remember this? Asgard is not a place. It's a people. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm confused here. If the ship was destroyed with all the Asgardians on it, 
Uh, how is it that there is a new Asgard on Earth and that Valkyrie and Korg are still with us? I thought that Thanos was put there to save the audience. I feel like we just missed a prime opportunity to remove these useless characters. Korg probably being the most useless and annoying character in the film right up there with those dreadful screaming goats. He he's basically the Jar Jar of the Marvel Universe. <laughs> and then there's the always welcome Valkyrie. It's true that in Avengers Endgame we get the new Asgard with no explanation as to how this came to be. Maybe, perhaps, uh, stay with me here, before Heimdall died, he sent some of the Asgardians to Earth and they had the fortitude to construct new Asgard in the exact spot Odin perished without knowing that's where it happened and the nor they didn't have any leadership. Oh wait, oh wait, wait, wait. Valkyrie was there. Plot hole explained. Yeah. Speaking of Valkyrie, she is no longer a prominent character on the Revenger team anyway. She feels more like a placeholder for an inclusivity checkmark. Her only purpose seemingly was to help the film meet the Bechdel test of female inclusion. A hand grenade? No, it's a portable speaker. But donning suits in the workplace and wearing a sweatshirt into battle, her character was a far cry from the positive feminine representation you would think would be desired. It's as though there was a concerted effort to be anything but feminine. And I suppose her bisexual character along with the Korg's gay outing was to help normalize LGBTQIA content and mark that box of inclusivity as well. Complete with a song and a story, Korg explains he comes from a race of man rocks. When we get together, we're gonna get it on and we're all gonna make some babies. That is the song that my dad sang to my other dad when they were courting. When two Cronins want to make a baby, they get together inside a mountain and they go down to a little lava pool. And they hold hands over the hot lava and then after a month, they pull their hands apart and they find they've created a beautiful new Cronin baby boy. Uh, but wait, in Ragnarok, didn't he have a mom? But didn't print enough pamphlets, so hardly anyone turned up except for my mum and her boyfriend who I hate. It's just too confusing. Uh, now he has two dads. Uh, this film is just checking political boxes left and right, all at the expense of the story. No need to worry about continuity here. Just reap what we sow, shut up, and give us your money. On another note, a common thread in both Thor and Dark World is Thor's romantic interest. Judy Foster. <laughs> so funny! Jodie Foster when it's really Jane Foster who comes up with this gold. <laughs> Okay, okay, sorry. That was just too good. Anyway, okay, so Thor's love interest, Jodie Fo Ah! Jane Foster! There it is again. Who took. Uh, sorry, one second. <clears throat> Who took a sabbatical from Ragnarok, but is back for Love and Thunder? Their relationship was framed in physical attraction, mutual respect, and a balanced emotional connection. However, their mystery and freshness is gone and has been replaced by awkward conversation that is uncommunicative and filled with emotional misfires that leave Thor babbling to himself in a true has-been form. Jane sees Thor, and by extension so too does the audience, as yesterday's crush and today's let down. The perfect metaphor to what Love and Thunder brings to the table, with an audience hoping for a balanced narrative with both highs and lows that deal with deep emotions that are tempered with humor and action, but instead are forced-fed gratuitous and pervasive juvenile funniness without end that never allows a punchline to land or audience to recover from. And Jane, who wields Mjolnir like Thor never could, is our new Lady Thor. First off, the name is Mighty Thor! Oh right, Mighty Thor, a, a character so concerned with getting the right superhero catchphrase, she never deals with the many trials surrounding her character, internal nor external. Jane is dying alone from stage 4 cancer, has the hope that Mjolnir will heal her with Asgardian magic, but learns that it has the exact opposite effect. So going at it alone, because she doesn't want to face nor divulge her weaknesses, she never course corrects, leading her to her eventual end. Never confiding in her ex-boyfriend Thor, or considering that perhaps his 1500 years of life could have provided him with the knowledge that could help her. But then again, why would he? He's just a man of after all. And it's not lost on me that when he does find out that she's dying from cancer, he ditches her at the hospital and runs off to face Gore alone before it's too late. To save her? No! <laughs> to save the gods, never mind the love of his life at death's door, and never considering that eternity, the plot device to end all plot devices could possibly save Jane. If you didn't know, eternity is basically an entity that will grant one wish to the first being to find it. And that's it. 
the one and only wish. No more wishes anymore for anybody else ever. So it seems to me if he just got there first, Gore would be stopped saving the gods and he could fix oh so many things, but at the very least, save Jane. But instead of worrying about the rescue of his long lost love, he empathizes with the God Butcher, who rather than facing the consequences of his wicked ways, is redeemed by love. Because after all, love is love, and the perfect justification to explain away any misadventure. It's interesting that this is the story Disney chose to tell in a time when self-indulgence is more important than self-improvement. When churches around the world are being burned, history being destroyed, and children being targeted, when politics reign supreme and the public is saturated in arrogance, pride, anger, immorality, hatred, greed, jealousy, and fear. This is the first time godlike beings have been represented in the Marvel Universe in this way. Gods who not only identify as divine, but that accept and desire the religious devotion and service of their acolytes to their cultists. Godlike beings who are callous, egotistical, and malicious, gods who are self-serving and indifferent to the pleas of not only their followers, but even to the needs of other gods. Consider when the audaciously adorned deity named Rapu mocks his last miserable worshiper Gore, ridiculing his belief in the promise of an eternal reward. Rapu claims that nothing awaits him after death and that his only purpose in life was to suffer for the gods. This horrifying revelation that Rapu, the god at the center of his belief system, is nothing more than an undeserving troll thrusts Gore down a path of revenge as he acquires a powerful dark weapon and under its curse sets out to exterminate all gods before the evil sword ends his own life. To call this film anti-religious might seem simplistic. However, this film's religious commentary is a plague that currently is spreading through society at an alarming rate. A fight against truth, tradition, belief, and freedom, while yes, gore is the antagonist of the story that is supposed to represent evil and what the audience should find as loathsome and detestable, but this plot doesn't really land. You would think that an antagonist with the nickname of The God Butcher wouldn't be a sympathetic villain. But he is, as these so-called gods are just as bad if not worse than gore, the gods seem to be defined by such attributes as pride, envy, gluttony, greed, lust, sloth, and wrath. Which incidentally are the seven deadly sins and don't garner the kind of warm favor required for a good versus evil storyline. Also, during a scandalous scene in the middle of the film, it is implied that as far as gods go, Rapu is the rule and not the exception. As Rapu ignores Gore's prayers, so too does Zeus ignore the pleas of Thor. And what's worse, Zeus attempts to detain Thor to prevent him from en engaging Gore. <laughs> Sorry, it just hit me. Uh, and perhaps betraying the secret location of omnipotent city. <clears throat> All with no evidence of dissent from the members of the Council of the Gods. Zeus's prestige among the gods is so great that even Thor is awed by him. So naturally, he turns out to be a showboating buffoon interested mainly in orgies. With such unworthy gods, naturally, the audience would likely empathize with Gore, our sympathetic villain slash anti-god. So why would Disney choose this story to tell? A story that demonizes deity and empathizes with evil, reversing the notions of good and bad, altering morality, and celebrating villains using empathy, respect, and love as weapons to act as the sugar to help the medicine go down. It's easy to look at the world around you, drenched in violence and turmoil, and then question if our traditions and faith really do lead to happiness, when apparently so many find pleasures in what are actually destructive behaviors that only lead to temporary gratification and regret. And then to have a film that attacks tradition and provides a one-sided representation of a god is manipulative and dangerous when you consider the kind of malleable minds this film is intended for. If you wanted to sabotage a faith-loving people, it's best to play the youth and alter their perspective, because in the long run, the youth will ultimately replace the adults. Adults seemingly stuck in their old-fashioned traditions, or is it just that they have matured enough to see the scam coming? Well, that's all folks. It's been informative. If this content has been helpful or absurd, let me know what you think in the comments below. All opinions are welcome here. Until next time, this has been another autofocus journey. I'm Steven Streeter. Catch ya on the flip side. How about that?
What a classic roar adventure. Hurrah!